Mantra 2. The gold vessel called Mahiman in front of the horse, which appeared about it, that is, pointing it out, is the day. Its source is the eastern sea. The silver vessel called Mahiman behind the horse, which appeared about it, is the night. Its source is the western sea. These two vessels called Mahiman appeared on either side of the horse. As a Haya, it carried the gods, as a Vajin, the celestial minstrels, as an Arvan, the Asuras, and as an Ashva, men. The Supreme Self is its stable, and the Supreme Self, or the sea, its source. The vessel called Mahiman, etc. Two sacrificial vessels called Mahiman, made of gold and silver respectively, are placed before and behind the horse. This is a meditation regarding them. The gold vessel is the day, because both are bright. How is it that the vessel in front of the horse, which appeared about, literally after it, is the day? Because the horse is Prajapati, and it is Prajapati consisting of the sun, etc., who is pointed out by the vessel that we are required to look upon as the day. The preposition Anu here does not mean after, but points out something. So the meaning is, the gold vessel, Mahiman, appeared pointing out the horse as Prajapati, just as we say lightning flashes pointing out Anu, the tree. Its source, the place from which the vessel is obtained, is the Eastern Sea. Literally translated, it would mean is in the Eastern Sea, but the locative case ending should be changed into the nominative to give the required sense. Similarly, the silver vessel behind the horse, which appeared about it, is the night, because both Rajata and Ratri begin with the same syllable, Ra, or because both are inferior to the previous set. Its source is the Western Sea. The vessels are called Mahiman because they indicate greatness. 
It is to the glory of the horse that a gold and a silver vessel are placed on each side of it. These two vessels called Mahiman, as described above, appeared on either side of the horse. The repetition of the sentence is to glorify the horse, as much as to say that for the above reasons it is a wonderful horse. The words as a haya, etc., are similarly eulogistic. Haya comes from the word he, meaning to move. Hence the word means possessing great speed, or it may mean a species of horse. It carried the gods, that is, made them gods, since it was prajapati, or literally carried them. It may be urged that this act of carrying is rather a reproach, but the answer is that carrying is natural to a horse, so it is not derogatory. On the contrary, the act, by bringing the horse into contact with the gods, was a promotion for it. Hence the sentence is a eulogy. Similarly, vajin and the other terms mean species of horses. As a vajin, it carried the celestial minstrels. The ellipsis must be supplied with the intermediate words. Similarly, as an arvan, it carried the asuras, and as an ashva, it carried men. The supreme self, samudra here means that, is its stable, the place where it is tied, and the supreme self, its source, the cause of its origin. Thus it has sprung from a pure source and lives in a pure spot. So it is a tribute to the horse. Or Samudra may mean the familiar sea, for the Shruti says, the horse has its source in water. Taitriya Sanghita 2.3.12 Namaste So what have we got here? What is this whole situation described in these two very powerful mantras? Well, it's like a magic mirror. Imagine a mirror on the wall. Huh? When you stand in front of it, you see a reflection of yourself. But if you move a little to the side and say the magic words, it shows you a reflection of God. See, this is the meaning of the sacrifice, the symbology. It's a symbol. It's actually, well, consider it like a computer. You first open the computer, it's a black mirror, right? It gives you only a very kind of dull reflection of yourself. But when you turn it on, boom, all kinds of things happen. And what are they? They're symbols, icons, right? <laughs> See? So the way the Vedic sacrifice works is by creating a symbol, redefining the name and form of something, uh, whatever it is, and assigning that to some aspect of the supreme, the infinite. That way, then we can have some relationship. Otherwise, the supreme is inconceivable, <laughs> isn't it? The infinity. Because we are individuals, we are limited. Our intelligence can't go beyond the limits of our personality. So we cannot perceive or conceive of the infinite, that which has no boundary. So the Vedas create all these symbols, beginning with Aum. And that's why every Vedic mantra and every Vedic sacrifice and really everything that you do in Vedic culture begins with and ends with Aum. Aum is the Alpha and the Omega. Aum is everything. Well, that can only be with Brahman. So Aum is a symbol for that absolute, that root substance that is the essence of everything, and that is consciousness, or at least it shows up in our world as consciousness, as the subjective self. 
See, the subjective self is different from the objective self, or that is, the conscious self is different from the empirical self. The empirical self is the body, your name, huh? all your connections with family and country and business and whatever in the world. But the subjective self, well, that's the one we're interested in. We don't care about the external, you know, objective, empirical self because it's temporary. It's going to go away. So we don't give it that much value, that much weight. We are focusing on the internal self, the real self, the permanent self, which is nothing but consciousness, of course, because that is the... Uh, the precursor to everything. Without consciousness, nothing else has any meaning. But then what we're doing is we're predicating a symbol on consciousness. The fact that we are irrevocably, indelibly, eternally conscious. And so we get to define that in any way we want. So here the horse is being defined as Hiranyagarbha. Rahma, or Virat, as he's called in Mandukya Upanishad. Basically, everything. Huh? The Virat Rupa, which was displayed by Krishna in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 15, is nothing but this same Virat, the same Jagrat, huh? Jagannath, the God that is everything and does everything, and this ultimately time. See, because to manifest anything, you have to have a place which is capable of holding that manifestation. To make a cup of tea, you have to have a pot. <laughs> so if you want to make a universe, you have to have a space. But not only a space, you have to have time. Hmm, space-time. So that is like the background. That is like the canvas on which then you can paint whatever you want. And how do you do that? By symbols. See, this is magic. This is practical ceremonial magic being described here. That's why it's so powerful. And that's why people are afraid of it. Because they've got all this, you know, Christian dualistic programming that says that's maya that's dangerous that gives you power and they don't want people to have power what is the power being detached from the consensus reality and connected with a, a different reality that runs by completely different rules and therefore being able to see uh look back and see and measure the so-called objective reality from a completely different platform. And what could be more different than Brahman, non-duality? See, there's a long-standing problem in philosophy, which is whether the world is real or unreal. Right? <laughs> and the the solution to it, of course, is yoga, right? There's no verbal solution. There's no conceptual revelation that can embrace this problem because you can't measure everything by anything else except another everything. And there isn't another everything. There's only one. By definition, there is only one everything. Only one infinity, true infinity, which is everything. So how can you measure it? Well, at least we can measure the universe, the manifestation, by the unmanifested, formless. See, But it's hard to explain all of this to people of average intelligence. It takes a long time. See, So in order to get an immediate result, the Vedic sages relied on practical ceremonial magic, 
Like that's what's going on in this temple here every day. Huh? If you've seen some of the recent videos, and I'm going to post more as soon as I figure out how to edit it and stuff like that. Richard, maybe you can help me. Um, what I want to do here is explain the connection between making symbols and making magic, making reality. What is magic? I mean, this this sounds like a whole, you know, you take this horse and you put a gold pot in front and a silver pot behind. What does this all mean, right? Well, it's symbology. It's symbolizing the universe and the flow of time and the sacrifice of the small self, the conditioned self, in the great self or Brahman which brings the everlasting bliss and all that good stuff, you know? So how do you do it practically? Well, you make a symbol. You take some object and you rename it and you just define it that this is Brahman. And that's what's going on in the horse sacrifice. It's, this is called thaumaturgy. And this is how you create civilizations, you, you make these rites, and then you say, well, this is this, and this is that, <laughs> and then you do stuff to them, right? Like here, the horse is being fed into the fire, literally. Killed, cut up in pieces, and fed into the fire. This is a traumatic experience for anyone that has a heart. Why do they do this? Well, just imagine you're in this kingdom, this ancient kingdom, and people have come by foot and by horse and by cart and by bullock and whatever from like hundreds of miles around, thousands of people, and they're all gathered there in a camp for like a month. And every day beginning early in the morning, the chanting starts. The Vedic chants, the Vedic mantras. So then fire is lit and sacrifices are made into the fire, which is defined as the mouth of God. See, if virat is hunger and hunger is death, then the fire represents that uh, never satisfied hunger, that mouth of God. So when the horse representing the ruler is sacrificed in the fire, to use the nice word, it creates a deep impression on the onlookers who have been, yes, conditioned by days of seeing Vedic rites, hearing Vedic mantras, eating Vedic food, which is offered for sacrifice very publicly and elaborately, you know, in front of everybody. And then at the climax of the thing is the horse sacrifice, Ashvamedha. Ashvamedha means literally horse sacrifice. So when this horse is sacrificed, it creates such a deep impression that all of the associated impressions of Vedic knowledge and wisdom and ceremony and so on are deeply embedded in the psyche of the onlookers. See, this is thaumaturgy. This is practical magic. This is how you create a civilization. And this was done in the ancient past by the rishis and the sages because they didn't have time to explain all the philosophy to everybody. Uh, I mean, some people just, just can't get it, you know, they're not, they don't have enough horsepower. Anyway, <laughs> this is how uh, you not only create a civilization, this is how you attain to Virat or Hiranyagarbha or Brahma, or whatever you want to call it, the universal form that I am everything and everything is a part of me and I am connected with everything. And the inter interconnectedness of all beings is the fundamental experience of Brahman realization. I mean, it's the first thing you realize, right? As far as the nature of Brahman. But this is still within the conditioned world. 
So this is realization of the secondary Brahma, the Brahman with qualities, but that's all right. It's the necessary step on the way to complete realization of the Brahman without qualities, Nirguna Brahma. And that is our eventual aim. But as a first step, basically we are conquering death and hunger by becoming them. See, in the context where that is identified with God. And so the energy is also there. If one uses these symbols properly. And this is why I guess I've been feeling tremendously energized and enthusiastic over the last few days, because I've been in this atmosphere of Vedic mantras, you know, 12, 16 hours a day sometimes, you know, and uh, fire ceremonies and where many, many things are elaborately offered into the fire. And then I'm reading this mantra and chanting it and recording it <laughs> and working with it hours and hours every day. So I'm getting a tremendous result from it. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but I feel great. <laughs> anyway, so this is how you become great. Virat means great, means everything. Just like Brahman. Brahman means Brahman, means everything. So to realize Virat or Hiranyagarbha or Brahman, what, you know, that's a big deal, right? Uh, because it frees you from all the problems of being a human being. My Adi Guru used to say, if you get a million dollars, all your one dollar problems are solved. So you name maybe even your hundred thousand dollar problems. So, you know, these days it would be probably be a billion dollars, right? But anyway, if you get Brahman, then that solves everything, you know, including the realization of the conditioned Brahman. But that's a step on the way. So we're going to go step by step, elaborately, with great logic and discussion through all these stages of spiritual revelation realization, and revolution. So hang on, fasten your seatbelt. Om Tat Sat, Om Shakti Om, Om Namah Shivaya. <laughs>